Good evening, everybody. I am really honored to be here amongst uh, such distinguished colleagues and people from that you know, resist the cold out there in order to listen to me. <laughs> and I'm very, very thankful for them. And I'm very honored because Walter or Robert was really a distinguished scientist, scientist. And one of the things that Emily didn't say, but I want to stress, is that Walter actually was uh, persecuted by the, um, the House for the Un-American Committee because he actually uh, stand out for his believings that science is beyond the interests of normal politics and he connects with the Russian scientists and the scientists across the world and he was persecuted by that. Then I am a, a tiny man to be here and I am very honored to be here and I could not stand uh, Walter's steps, but I'm very honored. First, another thing that um, uh, I, I'm very honored because uh, with this invitation, my talks are at a new height. You know, I never give a talk in a place where I ski. And then uh, it is really good. Uh, I'm giving a talk, but with two caveats. First of all, I am not a native speaker. Therefore, when I say potato, and you think that I'm saying potato, let's call the whole thing off, okay? <laughs> I try to overcome my lousy English. <clears throat> the second caveat is that I have a former advisor in the University of California, Santa Barbara, my dear David Hamilton. He always told, talked to me and said, when we have to give a talk, we have to give one idea. And if it's possible, half of it. Unfortunately, I never follow its steps. I always give a lot of ideas, a lot of them bad. Therefore, prepare yourself for a bumpy road. <laughs> it's like skiing an ungroomed slope in Aspen. And you guys have a lot of that, and I was not prepared for that. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Now, uh, I'm talking about predicting communities' resilience. We are discussing a lot about what is community, what is resilience. Then I want you guys to certain things that is very important. I'm, I want you guys to use your common sense idea about what is a community. Everybody knows that, in a way. Everybody knows that what is resilience. Because we, as scientists, we have been, in practitioners, we have been trying to define what is resilience, what is not resilience. But for the time being, with me, with this bumpy road, I want you guys to have the common sense idea. What is a community? You know it. What is resilience? Okay. That's the uh, uh, first part for, uh, for the beginning. Another thing that I want you to understand that we are talking about resilience in a changing climate. Yeah, it's interesting. But do not forget that now we have a lot of communities that are in a process of resilience. Because it's not only in the changing climate situations or when we have disasters that we have uh, a resilience of the community. Because now there are hard times for a lot of communities. And they are doing a resilience process. Therefore, resilience is actually an undergoing thing and for a lot of communities. And sometimes we scientists, we think, OK, let's prepare them for the resilience, for the disasters. But actually, communities are undergoing a lot of uh, disasters now. And you'll see it in a moment. Then, <clears throat> what is actually resilience? What is our objective? We don't want that people, uh, uh, the ecosystem suffer a lot, and also we don't want that people suffer. Basically, what is resilience? Is the way that people in the community go over the stresses, go over the disasters, and basically can bounce back. That means 
that basically they suffer the least. Sometimes we have to think that about because everything comes back to suffering and to human suffering. Okay? Because, you know, environment is suffered a lot. Now, uh, resilience. I don't want to go over this, but resilience has, is, a, is a, a very interesting concept that starts uh, uh, with the Romans, then in the literature, and then Bacon in the 7th century. Uh, and then we have the mechanics, the child psychology, the anthropology. Then resilience have been all over. But what I want you to focus is that I want to put together a lot of things for all this science. We go for the ecology, we go for the anthropology, we go for the psychology, in order to have an idea what is actually a common sense res resilience. But for my colleagues, that are here, I have to give a definition or an hypothesis of definition. Then, well, resilience is the magnitude of disturbance the system can tolerate and still persist. The ability of a system to anticipate, absorb, accommodate, or recover from the effects of a shock or stress in a timely and efficient manner. That means suffer less, <laughs> you know, basically. Now, uh, I want you guys to keep that in mind, and, uh, and also for my colleagues know that I know the story of the term, but let's go to the big picture. Now, one thing that we say that in this complex world, we have what we call the natural forcings, uh, the ecosystems and the human society. What I want to show to you is that communities have been changing this, and therefore going and changing that. But the point that I want to raise to you guys today is that the changing of this, also we change. Humans have been changing, and not necessary for the good process, and not good necessary for the good that they can have and they can pursue. Then I'm going to show you guys what I have been doing to this, but also I have been showed to you, I want to show you guys what this have been ch ch uh, changing to us. Now, changing the environment, everybody knows that. I am in, in that uh, uh, stuff, and we are talking about the Anthropocene. Uh, I just uh, finishing a paper with colleagues about. The, this concept of Anthropocene, the way people in the last times have been changing the Earth. For instance, every year, uh, 2.3, 10 plus 9th, I, I can s say that in, in tons a year of sediments that uh, we are actually uh, collected and we are not putting a huge amount of sediments into the oceans because we are retaining them. Then we are actually changing the world, changing the climate. And we have a lot of indicators that shows, and that change has been very stressed in the last part in, the, in, the, in what we call the Great Acceleration after the, the Second World War. But actually, my dear friends, changing air became much earlier. Every, when we arrive in Earth, we arrive from uh, in here. We were started our living here, and then we start to spread up. What this beautiful map shows is that as we go, we were destroying all our megafauna. Then we were completely wipe up all the big animals, and then the animals were completely erased as we get into the places. The last places where we did that was in Madagascar 1,000 years ago and in New Zealand about the same age. Then we go and then we wipe up the megafauna. Then that changed a lot. For instance, Australia, it's a very interesting system because what happened 46,000 years ago was that humans get out, get there, 
In 1,000 years, they wipe up the megafauna. The megafauna was basically eating herbs. Then, without those guys eating a lot of herbs, then the myomass bloom. And then with that blooming, what we have was fires. We have fires for years and years and years in Australia. We changed completely the landscape. And what we did? We have a change in climate. Then the first time that we know that actually we changed climate was in Australia. 40,000 years ago. Beautiful, huh? And scary. And you say, oh, how can they do? They were very good. This is the guys where I descend from. The, they occupy all the uh, European from almost 6,000 years. And look at the mechanism. Look at the lovely things that they design. This is machines really hook up to change and to be very efficient. You understand? And they were very efficient. Now, in here, in America, the, the guys that arrive here, they have a very different approach. They were very intelligent. What they did was they prevent the forest from growing. They have this wild, the prairie in the middle of, the, uh, of, uh, of America actually was resulting from fires in order to prevent the forest. And what our ancestors did was a very smart thing. They eat bisons and other animals. Then what they do was to augment the capacity of the bisons to, to reproduce themselves. And they prevent forests to come. Um, they what they did is that they prevent the not natural evolution of forests. And stop it here. Because as soon as they have forests, they, they put a lot of fires in it. In Portugal was the same thing. In Europe was the same thing with the shepherds after. Now, but if you think that things change, hope, this is a global changer, agriculture. Until that moment, we changed the environment, but we didn't change ourselves. We didn't change the group, the way we organized the group, and I'll say that later on. But with agriculture, we start to change that stuff very deeply. And then this is the places in the world where agriculture was actually independently uh, discovered. In all these areas, my dear friends, after 2,000 years, 1,000 years, all of these areas are actually were destroyed, salinized, and so on, started by the Middle East, where actually the, the desert that we have there was not a desert. Actually, technically, it was a prairie. It was becoming a desert after the use of uh, uh, humans. Now, what happened with agriculture was several points very important. A variability of food, but food that was less nutritional and high caloric. And then the people get shorter and they had a lot of diseases because the food was not as good as before. Second, they uh, start to, um, to they, they do a lot of complex societies with a lot of hierarchy, with a lot of slavery that start over because they have surplus. Another thing is that they start to become global. For instance, this is the Mediterranean. I live here. You are most welcome to, and I invited to be there. It's a wonderful place, not, not as high as husband. But this is the Mediterranean. At the end of the, the, the Roman Empire, Roman has about one million people. And they were having food for all over the place. What happened was Rome specialized the, the, the provinces. And then with changing in climate and problems, they die. In, in about 100 years, uh, they become from 1 million to about 200,000 million. Uh, 200,000 people. Then what happened is that agriculture became global. 
with a, a huge amount of hierarchy. And it is really important to you guys to understand because he started the cycles of destruction, the cycles, the cycles of destruction. Then agriculture, when we get the agriculture, we get the complexity of societies. And the societies start to be very stratified with a lot. Uh, uh, for instance, this is a beautiful place from anthropology where you have a central floor, the top rank resident, the second rank, the lower rankers. And then in the beginning, you have the slaves, because if you have an invasion, it was the, the first ones that will die, of course. And it, is much, it was very convenient. Now, uh, <laughs> what happened is that agriculture, what does is that you, you, you have a problem with the soil. Because after 100 years, if you don't uh, groom the soil well, you exhaust the soil, you exhaust the organic part of the soil, the soil. Now, a lot of agricultural civilization collapse. And, uh, but what is interesting that I want you to understand, that is about 4,000 years ago, we have a lot of complex societies, huge amount of marginal areas that change and were destroyed. The hunter-gatherers were expelled to marginal areas and environments more and more dependent of human action. I keep, I want, now we start to have resilience. Forget, it's very important this concept. You have ecosystems and you were in there. You do some, you, you kill some animals, sometimes you kill a lot of animals and so on. But with agriculture, the environment starts to be very dependent on the human action. The, the environment was actually a direct result of human action, was very expertise, a, a specialization of the environment. The environment to be that way, it, was, it has to be dependent upon the people. You understand? Now, this is very important to understand. Now, 14,000 years ago, then the normal movement was that sometimes the civilization, uh, like in Rome, they have problems. But when you have a civilization on an edge, what happens is if you have a climate transformation, you have really problems. Then 4,000 years ago, for instance, we have a huge changing transformation. Some people think that is... Uh, El Nino more consistent, whatever. But what we have is that we have warming climate, that we are expecting now. The monsoon stops in India and so on. Almost all society were disrupted in a very hard way. Egypt get this pattern. And that's why launched the Indo-European invasions to India, to Europe, and so on. All the migration start with the crisis, OK? Where I, you know, it's very similar, yeah. But some exceptions we have. We have as an exception from the Arapans. Arapans were a very interesting society, and I love it because they have even dancing girl. And uh, since I, I, I want, I love to dance, and then they they used to do that too. But what is interesting about the Arapans is that the Arapans would be able to resist much more to the climate change. Why? Because the Arapans, despite being a very, very agriculture, they have a very diversified income. They have forests, they have valleys, they have the water from the Himalayas, and they were a strongly egalitarian society. Okay? Then this is a very interesting thing because give us some hints in what actually prevent societies to collapse or they are more or less adapted to the changing climate, to the big stresses that we have. Now, and it is important to you to understand that. In the last uh, thousand years, we have two big, big changing climates. In, in the world. One between 12th century and 14th century, we have what we call the Little Light Ice Age. And what happened was that um, 
the, uh, the, the, the society is collapsed. So, it's, it's, why? Because actually, for instance, in Europe, they discovered the bridle for the horses, you know? And then instead of plow with oxes, they start to plow with horses. That was really much more efficient. And then they reduced the, play, the, the numbers of the, the people that were in the fields, and everybody goes to the cities, where I already, you know, everything goes back and forth. They go to the cities. And then, with the changing climate, we have winters, very dry, very cold, then disrupt completely, and then the soil was already exhausted. Then the people get in fam famine, and Igor uh, uh, make that point about Venice and the, the black, uh, the pla the black um, plague. plague. <laughs> exactly, black plague was not, not a cause, was a consequence of this really famine in the cities with no people, no conditions, no cleaning conditions, and so on. That the black plague was a consequence of this big disruption. But not only in Europe, in Chaco Canyon, in New Mexico, in the, in the, in the, in the places here uh, between Arizona and uh, from Colorado, Arizona to parts of California. Also civilizations like Chaco Canyon were very severely hurt because of the changing climate. They were in the edge all the agriculture, they push a lot, they cut a lot of the forest before, then when the changing climate happened, wow, they were not prepared. And they disappear. Chaco Canyon is nice because when I was here give, uh, uh, studying, I was there in the archaeologists, they didn't understand why such a complex city was in the middle of the desert. What they did understand by then, and that was not a desert became a desert, okay? With a help, with a little help from us, of course. <laughs> and uh, the same thing happened in, with the Mayas and uh, in the South America, it was exactly the same thing. What happened is that was a global thing. Now we are talking about global things. We are thinking that nowadays we have global phenomena. We are completely wrong. We have global phenomena all over, look, with that changing of climate, we all now have data that shows that all these regions in India, in Africa, in America, we, they have all the same problems after the climate change. And what they did, they finishing up the small communities of the, the rural areas, and they all aggregated in big cities with big, bad organization and bad conditions. And again, a lot of power. Now, and we are not talking about cities and qualities of cities. This is London in the 17th century. And the conditions of the city was really bad. Dozens of people died every day. Then in 1661 was the first environmental engineering paper. The guys, the engineers that are in the room, this is your forefather, OK? For me, even all the inconvenience of the air and smoke of London dissipated, some remedies only proposed. Okay? <laughs> Dozens of people die with the fog, and we, we, because people were poor, they were burning very uh, nasty uh, fuel, and therefore they uh, didn't, they killed themselves. Now, Vivaldi, the winter. G forte, strucciolato. 
cadere a terra di nuovo il sopra il ghiaccio e correr forte sì che il ghiaccio si rompe e si disserva. Ok, thank you. This is the winter. And this is Venice. And what people, everybody already listened to the Four Seasons. But what people don't know is that actually the Four Seasons was programmatic music. And then Vivaldi has a sonnet. And then, oh, she's, I hate to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> But actually, Uh, the, uh, the, the Four Seasons were programmatic music. Then Vivaldi wrote a poem, a sonnet. And now you should listen and you should read it. Now, what is this particularly interesting piece? And my dearest friend Emanuele uh, uh, did uh, uh, say it in, in, uh, in, uh, in Italian, a thing that I would never dare to do was that in this particular movement, Vivaldi was saying that was people that was playing in the ice, in the river that was icy, in, in completely, um, how you say, uh, frozen. And then they were jumping and so on, and suddenly the ice crack, and the people get into the, into the, into the river. Why this is interesting? Igor was with Elena three years in a row in Venice. I was a lot of times in Venice, you guys too. But where is the ice in winter? There is no ice in Venice. But there was an ice in Venice. For 50 years in the 18th century, we have another ice age with dry winters that again bring famine in Europe and bring another interesting thing, the French Revolution. The French Revolution is actually one of the factors, is the famine and the poverty that we have after this climate change again, like five centuries before. Now, this is the basic stuff that I want you to say and we're going to drive the conclusions about the history of climate change with communities. Now I want to answer to the second question. And the second question is, did we change? Where are we? Did we change from the previous moments where we are here? You guys are considered homo sapiens sapiens. That means in Latin, homing smart, intelligent, or whatever, then everybody would be, you know, an Einstein or something like that, a Newton. But today, I prove to you that you are not homo sapiens sapiens. I prove to you that you are homo social social. And the problem was that this evolution of society really changed and our really nature. What does the nature? Well, everybody knows that. I love this because, as you see, woman is following man, you know? <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's up front. <laughs> And it is very interesting because now we have studies that show that actually that is one thing that changed. Because now we know that in the previous days with undergatherers, women and men were equal. It was impossible for us to, to, to develop if not based in that equality. That's one thing that changed, not for the good. Now, what make us humans? You guys and I have three systems that came from animals. The stress system that prevent us to, to bad stimulus from, from the outside the immune system that protects us for the tiny little things, and the symbiosis, because we have a lot of animals in, our, in cell that we could not live without. Then this 
it interacts with that because when we are in stress, we could cut the immune system and that is bad for our, our health and also interfere with our beautiful symbiosis and they get nasty. They are normally good, but if the immune system cuts, then we have good stuff that become nasty stuff. But basically, this comes from the animals. All the animals have that. But what animals don't have is the neocortex, the big one, your intelligence, you must say. But actually, the size of neocortex doesn't come from, for the intelligence. The neocortex is completely related with the size of our group. Then the monkeys, the apes, and so on, they have groups of 10 and 50. We were wired to have groups of 150. That's why your balance be. And we spent 250,000 years in groups of 150 people. Then we create the neocortex because it's very difficult to be among people. <laughs> you know, we have to expect, I have to read what he thinks, he has to read what I think. We're gonna uh, kill some megafauna, yes, but before we have to articulate, and that you know, gives a lot of work. Then neocortex came up because we are a lot, 150. And we have three properties, my dear friends, that are very important in resilience. And you're going to see why. The anim all animals have connections. Mammals. Mammals have connections because the offspring, they need mothers, they need fathers, they need the group. They have connections. The primates, 20 million years ago, they have mind reading. The primates. They know what other thinks. They have theories of mind. Okay? Our children, about four, two to four, get that too. But we have the harmonizing. That means that our self concept is connected with the interests of the group. And the group is us, and us become the group. You understand? And it, that's the harmonizing. That's why we are unique. Now, why is this important? Because after agriculture, we start to be in a complex society with a lot of hierarchy. We are very sensitive for that. Okay? Now, and our stress become oof, up to the roof. The world is not Aspen, and the driving is not in Colorado. Join me in New Delhi. Join me in Morocco. Join me in Tunisia. Join me in Rome, Emanuele. I know that you are in forest. That's why I'm, yeah, I'm talking about Rome. Because if, was, if it is from Rome, you'll be hating me. And then we don't have the harmonizing stuff. Okay? Look. This is crowding. The other was noise. This is crowding. This is stress. This is chronic stress. And what you have in chronic stress is that in the outcome, you have passiveness, you have white it roll, you have Learn outnesses, you have paralysis. Okay, you have a lot of nasty consequences. Also, you have a, a problem with a lot of uh, uh, stuff in the, in, in the what, one of the reasons why we don't have, we have now a lot of problems in fertility is because in chronic stress we have problems, we shut down the reproductive system, and therefore people with high stress have problems 
with the fertility stuff. Okay? Now, if I tell you, give me a number, my dear. Thank you for, for, very much for coming. But if I ask you the amount of people that die every year in Europe, every year in Europe because of noise, yes, because of noise, you never get. No. And if I give you, thank God that you are sitting down, my dear, <laughs> because the number is really big number. It's 40,000 people. And they don't die because of the noise. They die because of the stress. The noise get them annoying. Then they have stress hormones. They have high blood pressure. They have hypertension. And they die of heart conditions. And you think, how come? If I say that 40,000 uh, 40, people die of air pollution in Europe, you would say, oh, that's not true. But I ask you, everybody, anybody see someone die from air pollution? Because people don't die from air pollution. People from di die from the complications evoked and provoked by air pollution. It's the same with noise. We do a lot of resilience, we do a lot of understanding the community, but we have to see what are the stresses that they have. We have to apply the theory to understand what they have and what they suffer. This is the study that I did with the construction of a road in Portugal. The people that were near the construction, what they did, look at that. They have a chronic, people didn't talk with them. The institutions, the, the government didn't talk with them. The construction uh, uh, company didn't talk with them. Nobody want nothing to do with them. And then they considered they were in chronic stress, they were powerless, and look at the problems that they have. I'm not talking about eh, a mild annoyance. I'm talking about people that were really disturbed, okay? Now, the most thing, but the, even that you're gonna ask, but you ask if we are changed by w the way we live. This is new research about neurology that shows that people have different activations in different a, a pattern of activations when they have, they grew up in Aspen or if they grew up in New York. They, even when they go and go from one place to another, they have different activations of the amygdala. What I'm saying, my dear friends, is that actually the fabric of society as we are now actually changes. us. And then this pattern of people have consequences in their living, in the way that they can absorb and respond to stress. Okay? Now, to finishing up. Oh, everybody like to do urban uh, gardening, uh, green spaces. Let's put green spaces. And why green spaces are important in the cities? Well, our quality, physical activity, social cohesion. Actually, the studies show that there's a connection directly between nature and health and through stress reduction. What is important when you put a garden in a city is not because it's beautiful, is not because, uh, but through stress reduction auments the capability of, the, of the, the, the community to overcome stress. Of course, that I can talk about also very important things in social. Uh, that means that, uh, for instance, this is the relation between money and happiness. What we're going to see is that you have a lot of poor people, poor countries that are happy. 
we don't have any, uh, and then we have some, some uh, uh, countries that are not uh, happy. But what is interesting is that the more happy and the more unhappy, they are not connect necessarily with the money. They have another factor that is much more important. The more happy are the guys in the Northern Europe, the more unhappy are the guys, for instance, in the Russian Federation and the whole uh, former uh, Soviet states, Albania, Iran, Latvia, here with really bad political and democracy and control. Communities doesn't have control. And over there, people are more equal and have more control. And for instance, the consequences, this is important for resilience. Now we have a new class divide in America, for instance. This is America. And you see the difference between when people are, when uh, the, the children are raised with single family or no, or are raised with two families. Uh, Look at the difference, okay? How family eats together, go, how time spent, and the probability that each, this factor, gets people to the college, okay? Now, this is a very interesting thing. This is Europe. In Italy and Portugal, 44% of the young men still live with their parents. This is a very stressful situation. <laughs> Gosh, wow. <laughs> now, uh, democracy and happiness. Actually, there is a, a connection between democracy and happiness. The power that people have, the community, the share, the empowerment of community and the results of that. And also, the, the, why people that are self-employed are more satisfied? Because actually they have more control and less stress. Now, oh, this is very interesting. The, the social capital, the people that you see as more happy, more equal, the Northern guys, are the ones that trust the others better. We, we hug a lot, man. We are Latins. But actually, we don't trust nobody. <laughs> <laughs> and why we don't trust nobody? Not because we are Latins. Because the structure of society, we are not equal. We don't have power. Now, guys, you say, I, I start to say two things. No. No. I start to say two things. First, that resilience is an undergoing phenomenon in communities. They are there. Second thing that I must say, they are there, and the, the, the current affair of a community is predicting how much resilience you're going to have with new stresses. Now, now you, as me, are able to understand the difference of life expectancy in New Orleans. Because now you have the factors. Look, this is the difference of life expectancy in New Orleans. That means this, a person that is born here, he has 50, 50, uh, 55 years of life expectancy. If you straight a line directly over there, that is about 10 miles, these guys would be living until 80. Then in seven miles, you have a 20, whatever, 25 years of difference. But now you understand. Yeah, you understand that are the, both the, the factors of the ecology of the system and both the factors of the social living that predict. And you are capable to tell me directly that that doesn't have to do nothing about resilience? I bet my life that the guys that are living here are much more resilient than the guys that are living here. I bet my life on it. And I'm sure that you'll bet your life too.
<laughs> now, to finishing up, how we can wrap up this? How can we have a theory out of this? For community, we are talking, let's, excuse me, my dears, I'm going to talk two minutes, theory. But in a theory that I'm sure that you're going to understand. Now, resilience is about systems. OK? Yes. We can define different systems. And one thing is resilience about energy company. Another thing is resilience about New Orleans. Another thing is about a certain community in Haspen, in the global, the valley, and all the stuff, the mountains that we have here. OK? And then the factors are different. But basically, there are two things that are over there. We can change the factors and adapt to the different systems. But one thing is the system, the ecosystem. That means if we, this is an interesting factor, the dependence of the ecosystem. You remember all the, my history examples? What we, we change the ecosystem in order to be more dependent on us completely specialized and compartmental. Then, if we have a, a, a larger ecosystem dependence, then less di biodiversity, higher specification of the, 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 what they do, and high levels of infrastructure, because the ecosystem became infrastructure dependent, then you have lower resilience. If you have higher biodiversity, if you have m more diversity, if you have lav uh, lower levels of infrastructure dependence, you have higher resilience. Then about people. We can do, we can in fact find factors that are scientific bound to uh, uh, predict resilience in the people. Impact, the other uh, stuff is impact in the individuals, groups, and communities. The less impact, the higher impact. The less control, the higher chronic stress, the more perceived inequity, and other factors that we can adjust depending on the community, then you have the, the uh, higher, lower uh, resilience and higher resilience. Up, then we have to find out factors of the ecosystem dependence and factors of the impacts of the individuals and group to predict communities' resilience. Because after 30 years of defending the environment in Portugal, in Europe, in being politician, be a scientific, be it whatever. I have to share a secret for you, with you, and I'll finish for tonight. In the bottom, what is important is human suffering. Thank you very much.